Welcome to Beth Haven Baptist Church. We are super glad that you've tuned in to join us for our services this evening. We'd like to uh, invite you to stand and sing along with us. These are pre-recorded songs from uh, previous services, but we hope that it'll be a blessing to you and an encouragement. I believe you can follow along with the words at the bottom of the screen, and we hope you enjoy spending some time praising the Lord with us tonight. God bless, and I'll be back in just a moment. Welcome to Beth Haven Baptist Church. Good to see you all again this evening. At this time, we're going to open up with the kids' choir. So if you could please find your place, and we'll open up with the kids' choir. stand with me turn to him 164 we're gonna praise him amen in fact we're gonna praise him praise him amen him 164 sing out with me on all three verses let's be lively this evening amen sing a little faster on this song to help us wake us up from that nap that slumber we entered earlier amen Hymn 164 on the first Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing over His wonderful love, proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise Blessed Redeemer, heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. 
turn to hymn 175. Hymn 175, it's just like his great love. Amen. Hymn 175, we'll sing the first, second, and last verse. A friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true. Just like Jesus all along the way, it's just like His great love. Sometimes the clouds of trouble bedim the sky above. I cannot see my Savior's face. I doubt His wondrous love, but He. From heaven's mercy seat, beholding my despair, in pity bursts the clouds between, and shows me He is there. It's just like Jesus to roll the clouds away. It's just like Jesus to keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love on the last. Oh, I could sing forever of Jesus' love divine. Of all his care and tenderness for this, for life of mine. It's just like Jesus who keep me day by day. It's just like Jesus all along the way. It's just like his great love. Amen. Good singing. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. We're glad that you are here, and I hope you've enjoyed singing a little bit tonight. Uh, we're going to take some time to uh, go to the Lord in prayer and to speak to Him. It's a wonderful opportunity we have on this wonderful Resurrection Sunday to spend time with our Father. And I hope that you took time this week to uh, read the passages of Scripture concerning the uh, crucifixion and, and the resurrection of our Lord. Uh, over the last couple of days, it's been an encouragement to me to listen to and to read through those passages and what a blessing it is to know him as our savior and we have that opportunity because of the resurrection and I'm looking forward tonight to speaking on that just a little bit more about knowing the power of his resurrection and I hope that God will speak to our hearts tonight I know he will if we'll allow him to but let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer right now if you want to kneel uh, there where you're at uh, whether it's at a couch or a chair and we'll we'll go to the Lord and we'll speak to him and as I pray I encourage you to pray as well and uh, come before the Father and, and lift up your heart to him. Lord we thank you so much. You are a wonderful and good God. You are so so good to us Lord we could never ever recount even and understand even all of the things that you've done for us. They're so many so bountiful and I thank you, Father, for this great day, the, the day that you rose from the dead as we observe that uh, your resurrection today and, and we are encouraged and we're thrilled, 
Father, in our hearts about the, the uh, honor of it, being able to be called your children and, and because of the resurrection, we're able to do that. And we thank you for that. And I thank you for the uh, blessing of being able to use the technologies that you've given us to be able to preach the gospel and teach and encourage our, our church family, Lord, during this time. And I know that, that there are many who are, are struggling during this time with all of the negative news, with all of the confinement and, and uh, discouraged right now because of uh, those type of things or maybe because of financial reasons or concerns for the financial future. And Lord, we know that these things can take a heavy toll upon the heart. We understand the emotional uh, conflict that many are experiencing right now, Lord, because it, it, because of all the uncertainty. But I also know that you are the great comforter, and we know that you are the one who is in control of our lives, of our circumstances, and we turn our hearts to you, and we lift up your holy name before us today. And I thank you for the opportunity to do so. I thank you that we can come boldly before the throne of grace and find grace to help in our time of need, that we can come to you and that your Holy Spirit can comfort us and strengthen us. And what an encouragement that is to know. And Lord, I just ask that right now that if there's someone that's listening to this service and they're in their home, they're discouraged, they're struggling, I pray that you'd strengthen in their heart. I pray that you'd help them to tonight to experience in their heart the power of your resurrection, the, the wonder of the glory of your power in Christ Jesus that you have made known in us through salvation. And I pray that you would strengthen and lift us up, accomplish your work, Lord, in us tonight, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We have a few more songs and a special, and then I'll be back to preach here in just a moment. Go ahead and stand if you would and sing along with us at home. Sing loud so we can hear you. Amen. If you'll stand with me again, we're going to sing one more hymn, hymn 174. Hymn 174. Sing this song out from your heart. Amen. Pray this out to the Lord. We'll sing the first, second, and last. My Jesus, I love Thee, I know Thou art mine, for Thee all the folly of sin I resign, my gracious Redeemer, my Savior. special this time. While walking down a memory lane of past not long ago, old 
Satan came right by my side, making me feel low. He brought up thoughts of hurt and pain when I had gone astray. He wanted to discourage me as I walked along my way. He said, you're undeserving, cause I know where you've been. I have a record of your life when you were bowed by sin. I know your darkest secrets that you would never tell. What makes you think you don't deserve a place with me in hell? I heard the old accuser and this was my reply. You're right for all the things I've done, I truly deserve to die. My righteousness is filthy rags, my goodness is unclean. There's only one thing I can say to what you said to me. It's under the blood, oh praise his dear name. I'm not what I used to be, my life's been changed. Not shackled by sin and shame, it's already gone. I'm happy reminding you it's under the blood. Victory was given me when I was born again. He washed my stained and sinful past and put new life within. No longer do I bear the mark that sin had brought my way. With happiness and peace of mind, praise God I now can say. It's under the blood. Oh, praise his dear name. I'm not what I used to be. My life's been changed. Not shackled by sin and shame. It's already gone. I'm happy reminding you it's under the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. It's under the blood. Oh, praise his dear name. I'm not what I used to be. My life's been changed. Not shackled by sin and shame. It's already gone. I'm happy reminding you it's under the blood. It's under the blood. Oh, praise his dear name. I'm not what I used to be, my life's been changed. Not shackled by sin and shame, it's already gone. I'm happy reminding you it's under the blood. I'm happy reminding you it's under the blood. Amen. Praise the Lord for good music and praise the Lord for the technology, be able to put these things together. And I, I hope you're enjoying uh, seeing some of the folks as they come around and seeing some of the different, uh, different music that uh, God's allowed to come through our church and the song leading and, and uh, the instruments and all that. It's been a blessing to me to see that also. If you would take your Bibles over to the book of Philippians again tonight and chapter number three. And we're going to look at verse number 7 through 14 again, and we're going to look at a, another topic from this passage, and tonight we're going to talk about how to know the power of Christ's resurrection, how to know the power 
of Christ's resurrection. This morning we talked about how to attain unto Christ's resurrection. And tonight we're going to talk a little bit further once we have received Christ, how do we know the power uh, uh, that's available through the resurrection, through the cross for us as believers. If you would, take your Bible. If you're in Philippians chapter number 3, if you would stand and we'll read the scriptures here in verse number 7. It says, what, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him." May, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may appre that if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore as many as be perfect be thus minded, and if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal this even unto you. Father, I pray that you would help us this evening as we consider your word. Use it, Lord, to our benefit, to our strengthening. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. One of the things about the Bible that always amazes me is how often we can go back to a, the same passage of Scripture and find extended truth uh, from the Word. And what a blessing it is. I've preached out of this passage many different times, and yet every time I look at it, God gives more and more and more, and it's just an awesome thing how God uses His Word and allows the Holy Spirit to, to instruct and to teach and to expand on His Word. As I look at this, I notice that statement that, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And isn't it interesting that so often uh, we have this tendency uh, to have that, that attitude or that idea that um, I wish that I knew I wish that I knew God more. I wish that I had a closer relationship with him. I wish I could, could really know him and understand him. And yet the Bible makes that statement that that I may know him. In other words, God wants you to know him. God wants you to have a closeness with him. He wants to have an intimate fellowship relationship with you. And he's given us the means whereby we can have that time with him, where we can truly come into his presence, into his fellowship, and and truly know him. And as I look at this passage, the latter part of this passage, beginning in verse number 10, there where it says that I may know him, I notice several things that just stand out to me that I think are integral parts or intricate or, or required things if I'm going to know him that I have to put into my life. I, I have to add these things or I have to yield myself in these areas, in these ways, if I'm going to have that knowing that closeness, that, that knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ. And the first thing that I noticed there is that I have to, in verse number 10, I have to come to the place where I accept the cross personally. <clears throat> he says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, but he says this, and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. As you've read the last few weeks, or I'm sorry, the last few days uh, through the account of, of uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection and all the things that transpire there as, as Christ is being led uh, to his, his crucifixion and, and the, the times he was there before Pilate and the time he was before Herod and, and the time that he was beaten and all of these things, uh, the, the suffering that he went through is what he's talking about here, the fellowship of his suffering that as, as a believer, we are to come to a point where we recognize suffering. Now listen, 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 that we recognize suffering 
as God's useful tool in our lives to bring us to the place that we can identify with Jesus Christ. Because I can't identify as long as everything's good, as long as everything's awesome in my life. I, I come to that place where everything's good. How am I going to identify with the suffering of Christ if I do not experience suffering in my life? And, and I'm not talking about suffering as Christ suffered. There's a lot of uh, confused people. I, I'm, I don't know if they did it this year because of all the, the virus stuff, but I'm sure some did over in the Philippines during this time of year, uh, during this this past week, people will literally uh, beat themselves with whips and have themselves crucified and hung up on a cross in that idea of that they are going to suffer with Christ. That's not what he's talking about. That's, that's actually wicked and sinful type thinking. But when you look in the scriptures and you understand that God will allow suffering to come in our life, and you look at the book of First Peter, First Peter talks extensively about suffering and how when we go through through suffering that is not because of our own wrongdoing, right? We're, we're doing right, and God allows suffering to come in our life. If we will accept that as an opportunity to learn identification with Christ and what he endured for us, if we accept it and we yield ourselves and we do what Christ did, we commit ourselves to him that judgeth, and we say, God, we're going to leave it in your hands. I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm not going to try and, and vindicate myself. I'm not going to try and, and accomplish this, uh, this getting out of this problem on my own. I'm just going to trust you. Then we can come to a place where we identify where we are in the fellowship of his suffering, even on this earth while we're going through those things. Listen, it's when we come to that place that we do what he says here in verse number 10, that I'm made conformable unto his death when we accept the cross personally, where we stop fighting against what God's trying to do in our life. We stop fighting against the working of God and the will of God in our life. And we yield ourselves to God and we say, God, whatever it is that you want to do in my life, I will allow you to do it. I'm yielding myself to the cross. I'm yielding myself to going and doing what you would have me to do. That's not a pleasant thing. Crucifixion is not a pleasant thing. And it's not a pleasant thing to happen in our lives. It's difficult. It's, it's painful. It, it's miserable sometimes. But it's necessary if we're going to know the power of Christ's resurrection. You cannot know the power of the position of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, if you do not endure the sufferings with him. You cannot know the power of Christ if you do not endure and come to the place of laying yourself down on the cross and giving up to him what it is he asks from you. Jesus said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine. And so many believers have never come to that position where they said to God, not my will, but thine be done. And they don't know the power of Christ's resurrection because they've never come through the point of the crucifixion in their own life. In Romans chapter number 6 and verse 6 and 7, it says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. If we're going to have that victorious life, that, that life that knows the power of the resurrection, then we have to go through the point of recognizing our old man crucified and dying to the old nature. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but the Christ, but Christ liveth in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God's love for me, his sacrifice for me, was not just so that I could be saved, but it was also to be a pattern whereby I might crucify the old nature, the old man, the old sinful lusts. I might put them away and begin to live the victorious life that Christ has purchased for us. Are you living that? Are you living a victorious life? Are you living a life of victory over sin, victory over temptation, victory over those old lusts? Or are you living in those things? Now, come on. Won't you be honest about that? 
the reason so many people don't know the power of Christ's resurrection. They know about it, but they don't know it. In other words, they've never experienced it. They aren't experiencing the fullness of joy. They aren't experiencing the victory in Christ. The reason is because they've never accepted the cross personally. Some, some would say, Jesus died, so I don't have to. And praise God, that is true from an eternal salvation standpoint. But let's be honest here, as believers, Jesus Christ died to give me an example of how to as well. It's not just about his death in this sense of experiencing the power of his resurrection. It's also about my choice to die as he died, not in a physical sense, in a spiritual sense, in, in, my, in my inner man to put away and die to the old nature so that I might know the power of his resurrection. I have to accept the cross. Personally, that's what Paul did. That's why Paul said, our old man is crucified with him. That's why Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. I am dead because to the old. I am dead to the, to the sinful. I am dead to the lust. I am dead. I chose to crucify myself with Christ. That's exactly what he's talking about here in verse number 10, that we ought to be made conformable unto his death. If we're going to know the resurrection, we have to come to that place. I notice then also in verse number 12, it says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. I notice this as a second thought that I need, if I'm going to know the power of his resurrection, I'm going to have to commit to following. I'm going to have to commit to following. You know, there's a lot of a lot of times in my life that I haven't wanted to follow the leaders God's put in my life in a spiritual sense. I didn't like the, the lessons. I didn't like the direction sometimes. And, and yet at the same time, I, I've said this before, and, I, and listen, it's an absolute truth. Uh, it's not submission if you agree. And sometimes God puts a leader in my life that I don't really care to, to hear from. I don't really care to, to, uh, to follow, and yet God put them there. But I notice a couple different people in the Scriptures that we're told that we are to follow as, as uh, our spiritual leadership and follow in regards to this area of attaining to the power or knowing the power of Christ's resurrection. First, obviously, the Bible tells us that we're to follow the Savior. In Luke chapter number 9, verse 23, Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and what? Follow me. So notice there the connection between following Christ and taking up the cross or, or accepting the cross. Personally, there has to come a point where I say, all right, Lord, I'm going to take up the cross and I'm going to follow you. I'm going to commit myself to your direction. In 2 Peter chapter number 2 and verse 21, it says, For even here too were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Because, notice, because he suffered for us and we are to follow in his steps. That goes to exactly what I was saying in the previous uh, point there about accepting the cross personally. He said, follow me. And that literally means that we are to follow him in dying to the old man, dying to self, dying to our lust, dying to sin. We are to die to those things just as he died because of those things. We are to die to those things. We're to follow that example. We're to follow our Heavenly Father. It says in uh, Ephesians 5.1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. I like to know that I have a Father in heaven. I, I love that, that truth. Uh, listen, uh, I, I was talking one time to, a, to an individual who uh, really did uh, despise the Lord, didn't have any desire to have any, anything to do with God. And one of their... One of their uh, uh, disagreements with the Word of God is, you, you know, your Bible, it, it, it minimizes people and it tells them they're just children. And I said, man, I am, I am encouraged by the fact that I am a child of God. I am encouraged by the fact that He is my Father because, you know, I know what it's like to have a good father. Praise God I do. And I, I, I thank God for my dad. My dad was a wonderful father to me and continues to be a wonderful father to me. And, and I praise God for that. But I will tell you this, as wonderful as my dad on this earth is. He is no way in, com 
in any fashion comparable to how wonderful my heavenly Father is and what He's done for me and what He continues to do for me. I'm glad that I can say I am a child of God and that I can say as a child of God, I'm following Him as my heavenly Father. He loves me. He cares for me. He's directing me. He's he's comforting me. He's strengthening me. He's providing for me. All those things that a father does for a child, He does for me. But He says, follow me. Follow me. And listen, if I wander away from him, I'm not going to experience the closeness that he wants to have with me. I won't experience the provision and and the protection that he has available for me, but that'll be my choice wandering away from him. I want to stay right close to him just like a a child should to their father. uh, So many times I remember uh, my kids taking them various places and, and saying to them, now listen, stay right with me. Do not get away. Do not tear. Uh, do not pull yourself away uh, from me. Don't get distracted by something else. You need to stay with me. And grabbing hold of their hands, you know, taking them with. Why? Because I cared about them. I protected them, and I took them forward to see good things. I I, uh, I get frustrated sometimes. My my dad kind of drilled into me this idea about following and how how to follow. And one of the things that he drilled into my head is that when you're following, you should never get so far behind that the leader doesn't know you're there. That, that's an important thing to me. My dad drilled that. I need, if I'm going to lead you properly, I, don't, I cannot stop and try and figure out where you're at. You have to be right behind me so I know you're there so that I can lead you in a proper way. Otherwise, you're hindering me leading you. And boy, I tell you what, every once in a while when Angela and I got married, uh, we went through that. Uh, honey, now, you're going to follow me. Okay, and, and here, uh, I'm, I'm talking real early on. I was, I was driving, and all of a sudden, she was nowhere around behind me. I had to pull over to the side, and I waited and waited, and finally, she came up, and, and I said, what, where did you go? She said, well, I was following you. I said, you weren't following me. You couldn't even see me. I know you couldn't see me because I couldn't see you. And, and if you're going to follow me, you got to stay right behind me. You got to or else you can't be following me. And uh, we had the, a really, you know, sweet fellowship over that. <laughs> but, uh, but you know what? She follows me. She does. I'm going to tell you something. When a leader, if they're going to lead, they have to know you're following and the Lord needs to know you're following follow as dear children. Hey, your kids need to, your kids don't know where you're going. They, here's the problem. They sometimes think they know where you're going, but they don't know where you're going. And you need to teach them how to follow. And one of the ways that you're going to teach them how to follow is by how you follow. Come on now, by how you follow. How do you follow? And that's the example they're seeing. If you're, if you're someone that kind of follows by drifting off, doing your own thing here and there, and you're generally going the same direction, but, but you can't see the leader on down there, you just know he's up there somewhere, then you're not a good follower. Come on. You're not. No, no, no. If you are a good follower, you're going to be up where the leader's at so you can see him and he knows you're there and that closeness allows him to lead you in a perfect way. That's how we ought to follow our Heavenly Father. Follow the Savior. Follow the Father. Not only does the Bible tell us to do that, it says just follow what's good. 1 Thessalonians 5.15, See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. 1 Peter chapter number 3, verse 13, And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good, do, doing good, doing right according to the word of God, and letting the Bible be a guide for what is good and right in our lives, not following that which is evil, not following that which is, is contrary to the goodness and the good things of God, that that's a similar to what he says also is that we are to follow righteous, what is righteous. He says in first, uh, Second Timothy, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 22, flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I'm going to follow what, um, if I'm going to follow the Savior and I'm going to follow God, I'm going to have to follow that which is good according to the word of God. And I'm going to have to follow that which is righteous. That's, that is set by what God says is righteous, not what man says is righteous. I'm going to have to follow that if I'm following God. Not only that, but the Bible says that I'm to follow the example of steadfast churches. 
It says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 14, For ye, brethren, become followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye have suffered the like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Listen, we ought to, we ought to keep ourselves close to the people of God, to the church that God has made us a part of. Someone, uh, someone came over to my house this past week and, uh, to get a face mask that, that uh, some of the ladies have been sewing and, and uh, uh, picked up a face mask. And, and they made the statement, Pastor, I'm just concerned that when all of this is over, some that were there before might not be there. And you know, that's not, I can't say that's not gone through my heart. There's a concern there. I, I love everybody in our church. I don't want anyone to fall away. But listen to me. If you're not careful, if you don't follow after the church God's put you in, it can happen. People drift away. People drift away when things like this aren't going on. You have to be responsible for taking up the mantle of following and keeping yourself accountable to that. Not only are we to follow in that way, but also the Bible tells us that we're to follow the spiritual examples that God's put in our life. Uh, in, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 7, it says, For yourselves know how you ought to follow us, Paul said. Uh, Paul said, follow our example. In verse number nine of that same chapter, he says, because we have not power, uh, we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. He said, we're not trying to control you. Boy, this is one of the, one of the things I see as an issue in our day right now is the concept between influence and control is so evident in people's mentality because there are some who are leading from a leadership standpoint of influence. And they're saying, this is what's right. This is what people ought to do. But you need to take personal responsibility for it. Notably, by the way, I think the governor of North Dakota has done a fantastic job in that, saying this is what we're asking, but you have to take responsibility. We're not going to make mandates that we're going to come in and, and, uh, and enforce in a physical way. But then you have others who that's exactly what they're trying to do. And they're going in and they're, they're saying, uh, you either do it or else. And, and anybody that doesn't do what we say, we're going to throw you in jail. And at the same time, they're letting other people out of jail. It's some, one of the craziest things I've ever seen in my life. But this mentality, that, that wrongheadedness concerning leadership, Paul said, we don't have power to force you. Listen, as a pastor, I cannot force you to do what God called you to do. I can't force you to be obedient to the word of God. God, and I shouldn't have to force you. You have a responsibility to God that goes beyond my responsibility. My responsibility is to tell. Your responsibility is to do, not because I say so, but because God has said so in his word. And Paul says, I can't force you, but I can set an example for you. And you ought to follow the example that I am setting. That's why it's important that a pastor, a, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, a, a, a workers in the church say, Set a good example. Set a godly example. It's important. We're to be that, that leaders in that regard. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Paul said the same thing. Be followers of me. Here's what he said. Even as I am of Christ. He said, I'm following him, and I'm trying to set an example for how you can follow him. If you'll just follow. Listen, since I'm following him, if you follow me as I follow him, we're both following him. Amen. No conflict there. We'll both follow him together. Philippians uh, 3 and verse number 17, we read here, uh, be followers together of me and mark them which also which have us for an ensample. Uh, listen, we are to follow the Lord and we're to mark those who are causing division, contention, and or not following Christ, who say they're following Christ, but they're not following Christ. We're to mark those and we're to say, you know what? This person isn't someone I should follow. I need to follow those who are following Christ. 1 Timothy 1, 6, become followers of us and the joy and of the Lord having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. In Hebrews chapter 6, verse number 12, be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Hebrews 13, verse 7, remember those who have the rule over you, have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Listen, Paul, Paul was very clear, and the writer of Hebrews very clear, that pastors and, and Christian leaders, uh, deacons and Sunday school teachers and, and uh, so forth in the church, ought to be examples that others can follow. It's important. But you're not to follow us 
as people, you are to follow our example. Now listen to this. You are not to follow me as a man and say, I'm a follower of Rick Carter. No, 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 no. That's not at all what Paul said. He said, follow my example of following Christ. In other words, don't ever think of yourself as being a follower of the pastor. Think of yourself as following the example the pastor has set of following Christ. That's what God wants. He wants me, he wants others in our church, the leaders of our church, to be examples of how to follow Christ so you can learn not to follow us, but to follow him by our example. To follow him as you see others in the church following him. Why? Because he is the one that we are to follow. That's what it said here in the scriptures in verse number 12. Uh, I follow after if I am I apprehended that for which I am apprehended of Christ. I follow him. I follow his, his will in my life, his direction, his truth, his word. I follow it just like others that I see that God's put in my life that set an example of how to follow him. I'm following their example of following following him. What a blessing that is. I'm glad God gave us some examples. I tell you what, honestly, uh, sometimes I can be kind of dense and not really understand everything, not really understand the, the uh, way I should do things, but God's given me good examples in my life to be able to see how they followed the Lord and I can follow him in the same way and what a blessing it is. And sometimes I don't understand why things are done the way they're done. Now, listen, I, I, there have been times where I have explained things to people and, and I say, here, uh, we're going to do this and, and do it this way. Why, why, why do we have to do it that way? Well, because that's how it needs to be. Well, I don't understand. Well, let's do it and then you'll understand. You ever been in that point? Let's do it. And then you'll understand. And so you do it, and then you go, oh, oh, okay, I get it. I get it now, right? Well, there have been times in my life when I had to submit to the faith of my pastor or the faith of a, of a, of a, of a spiritual leader God put in my life. And when I didn't understand it, but they're saying to me, this is the way, this is the way, uh, follow my faith. If you don't have your own, follow mine. And I followed, and then I went, oh, that's why, that's how. I get it now. Right? I get it now because I, I was willing to follow their example. And praise God that God gives us that opportunity as a believer. So what do I need to do? Well, I need to accept the cross personally. I need to commit myself to following. If I'm going to know the power of Christ's resurrection, I, not only do I need to do that, but the Bible tells us I need to forget the past. And, and I mean that in a very distinct way. Forget the past. In other words, forget everything that you had before, the things of the, of the past, the, the direction of the past, the, the filthiness of the past. But you also need to forget not just the pursuit of those things, but you need to forget the, the conflict of those things in your own mind. Because one of the problems, the things that hinders people from knowing the power of Christ's resurrection is that Satan has a tendency to overwhelm them with the guilt of their past, especially if they had come, gotten saved at later in life life and they look back and they go, man, what about all those things that I've done? I, I've ruined my life. I've wasted it. God can't use me. Can, can listen to me. God used David and David was an adulterer. God used David and David was a murderer. Uh, God used Moses and Moses was a murderer. God, God can use you. God used Paul and Paul was a murderer and, 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 and wrecked havoc of the churches. God can use you. There is nothing in your past that isn't covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. But you have to do what Paul said here. Can you imagine the conflict that would have raged in his mind concerning what he had done in the past to God and to believers? And he says in verse number 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind Forgetting those things which are behind. Listen, your past has been paid for on the cross. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid for every single sin you would ever commit. Everything you've done before, he has paid for. He has paid for it. It's forgiven. Why are you still trying to pay for it with guilty feelings? 
Why are you still trying to pay for it with that feeling of conflict and turmoil in your heart and, and trying to beat yourself up and trying to afflict yourself? And listen, there's a doctrine, uh, a false doctrine called asceticism uh, that, that people uh, follow. And, and it, it simply means this, that, that you can punish yourself for your past sins. But listen to me. Jesus Christ paid every bit of the price necessary for your sin. It is covered. It is gone. The past is, is put away if it's under the blood. Quit allowing your past to overcome you and destroy your future. Yeah, your past has been paid for. You have to reject. You have to choose to reject guilt and shame. In Romans chapter number 9 and verse number 33, it says this. I, I love this statement. It says, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth in, on him shall not be ashamed. Now listen to that statement. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Romans 10, verse number 11 says the same thing. But the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And, and someone might read that verse and say, Well, pastor, what that's talking about is that if you've believed, you won't be ashamed to say that you've believed. I agree. It does mean that. But can I say that the Bible gives another indication for that statement that if you've believed on him, if you've truly believed on him, then you have to believe that everything from your past has been covered and there's no more cause for shame any longer. Do you get that? Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed because if you believe on him, you have to accept he is payment for all your sin. So what is it that you're ashamed about now? What is it that you're still allowing the devil to hold over you and, and, and to, to keep you from understanding and knowing the power of Christ's resurrection? What is that thing back there that you're allowing the devil to use against you? Listen, if you've believed on Jesus, he covered that thing. He paid for it. It's under the blood. He says in Romans 5.5, 5, this is awesome. Hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Wait a minute. If you have hope in Jesus Christ, it will make you not ashamed. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to glory in the old things. It means that you're not going to let the old things have dominance over you and prohibit you from going forward for Jesus Christ. Don't let your forgiven past pollute your promising future. Don't let the devil hold you captive to those things of your past. You can know the power of the resurrection. You can know the, the victory in Jesus Christ. You just have to choose, choose to make the cross, pers choose the cross personally. And you have to choose to follow. And you have to forget the past. And then there's one more thing he says here. And that is, is you have to pursue the prize. Pursue the prize. Look at verse number 14. I press toward the mark of the prize for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. The prize of the high calling of God. God has a purpose for your life. He has a plan for you. He has a direction for you. He wants to use you to accomplish wonderful and great things for His, uh, for his glory and His kingdom. God wants you to, to do that. But it, listen, if you're dead to the flesh and the world, then there's nothing here for you to pursue. So you have to do this. You have to do what God says. Put your heart on Christ. Put your heart on Christ. Set your affections on him. It says in, in Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 1 through 4, if ye be risen with Christ, there we go, the power of his resurrection, if ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on the things of this earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with, in, with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life shall appear, then shall ye also appear, with him in glory. Set your affections on him. Put your heart on him. Turn your eyes to him and pursue him with a passion. Pursue him and pursue his good kingdom and pursue his good work in your life. Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Here's the reason so many people do not experience and know the power of Christ's resurrection. One, they are not 
coming personally to the place of the cross and dying as Christ died and gave us an example. They're still living to the flesh. They're not dead to it. They haven't come to that point of personal crucifixion to the old nature. Uh, listen, they're not e either that or they're not following in the examples that God has set through Jesus Christ and through the New Testament church and told them, follow as a child. Follow me as a child. Quit trying to understand it all. Uh, listen, be not wise in thine own understanding. Fear the Lord and depart from evil, Solomon said. Follow the examples that I've given you to follow. Listen, don't follow those men. Follow their example of following me. Forget the past. Don't let the devil hold you back any longer by it. And commit yourself to pursuing the prize first and foremost in your heart. Isn't that the great commandment? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul, with all thy might. There's nothing left after that, by the way. There's not anything left for this world if we're doing it right. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek those, set your affection on those things which are above. Pursue the prize. Pursue the prize. God has something wonderful for us. God has something wonderful for you. And listen to me. This situation that we're experiencing here in this world right now, all the, the conflict and the, and the crisis that we're experiencing right now, all of this will fade away. There will be a time where this will be a distant memory, but listen to me. Your commitment to Christ is what will pull you through times like this. You're going to go through more crises in your life. You're going to go through more troubles and more problems in your life. If you're pursuing the things of this world, they're going to overwhelm you. If your heart is set on this world, they'll destroy you. But if your heart's set on Christ, if your mind is set on Him, boy, I tell you, the power of His resurrection, the power of His resurrection in our life can give us strength to overcome anything that this world has to offer. How do I know? Because it gave Him strength to overcome man's greatest foe, which is death, which is what all the chaos right now is about. People are going to die. Christ overcame death. And you can have the power of his resurrection in your heart, the victory over this world's concern and chaos and, and, and trouble if you'll do the things that the Bible says for us to do, if you'll commit yourself to pursuing Christ and all else fade away. Seek him. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for the goodness that you've done for us through Jesus Christ, the grace that you've given, the blessing that you've given. What a wonderful, awesome thing it is for us to know you. And I pray that right now, each one that hears this message might in their hearts tune to you and apply this in their heart, Lord. Apply this willingly, willfully making a decision to pursue you. I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Appreciate you tuning in. What a blessing it is to uh, be able to bring the word this way. But we're looking forward, of course, to an opportunity to uh, being able to see you again. I, I don't know if I mentioned, uh, but um, we, we've added some members over here in the in the gallery. I've got a couple uh, uh, folks, Matt and Andrea and, and Gus came in and put in a, a box that has I don't know what is it just a cardboard and it has their picture pat on it and, and a shirt on there. It's a it's really pretty funny. Uh, but uh, what a blessing that is and encouraging me. Uh, just uh, see the congregation growing, amen. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in person in the congregation soon in the near future. And we're excited about that opportunity coming down the road here for us. God bless you, and I'll talk to you again soon.